Welcome to LifeSpring Church. We hope you enjoy this message. To find out more about LifeSpring Church, head to linktr.ee forward slash LifeSpring UK. Here I am. I'm having to isolate. I've been pinged. So I'm so sorry I'm not with you and you're having to have a recording this morning. Uh, anyway, moving swiftly on, Debs. Don't say anything. Um, so I am carrying on talking about love and um, carrying on that series that Neville started. And um, I want to start with, um, I guess, you know, I'm an English teacher. I teach English literature and language at GCSE and A level. Um, and maybe you know, maybe you don't know that poetry is my favorite thing to teach. Now don't panic, I can feel some panic already rising in the room. Um, and one of the poems that I have to, or I actually love to teach, is Sonnet 116 um, by Shakespeare. And if I say a little bit to you, I'm sure you're going to go, oh I know that one, because it's probably one of the most famous love poems ever. So let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love isn't love that alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. Now I'm going to stop there because we don't have inner healing on speed dial yet and a lot of you are going, you're taking me back to poetry lessons with my English teacher. Um, sorry about that. But when I teach this, the reason I'm mentioning it is that I'm teaching 15, 14, 15, 16 year olds, that kind of age range. And normally before I introduce them to the poem, I ask them, to tell me what they think love is and how important it is. And two threads continually come back to me in that feedback. One, love is a feeling, that's how they describe it. And two, it doesn't last, it's transitory. And I think that's a really, really sad thing. And in fact, if I think about my students, most of them don't come from a married home. They don't have any grid for the love that's actually talked about in that poem, a married love, a committed love, a love that looks on any storm and is never shaken, that um, lasts. So while, you know, we're looking at this very, very, very important theme that gets to the heart of who God is and what he's called us to do. Um, I think we owe the younger generations the opportunity to know what love really is. You know, love has got to mean more than just a feeling and something that doesn't last. In fact, you know, if I think about it, most people deep down are quite terrified by love. They see it as a place of pain, a place of vulnerability, somewhere where your heart's gonna get broken, um, betrayal, disappointment, loneliness. That's kind of the deal around love and actually it's terrifying to take that risk and give your heart to someone else when actually the love Jesus talks about drives out fear. So, you know, if we say to people, Jesus loves you, I think they would just feel it's words and they just don't have a grid for the passionate, committed, sacrificial love that is behind those words. And we owe it to them to show them what love is. So with that in mind, my text um, for today uh, if you can find it on your phones or in your Bibles, is John 13, John 13, John 13, uh, verses 34 to 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, 
everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So in other words, Jesus is saying, the way people tell if you're the real deal, if you're a genuine follower of Jesus, is by the way you love other people. Bit challenging, bit daunting, incredibly inspirational. Whenever I, you know, think about what Jesus says and I think about these verses, I just think, isn't he great? Doesn't he get to the heart of things? Aren't his values solid? Aren't they just what you want your values to be? It really inspires me. But at the same time, I'm daunted because it's as he loved, I'm to love. So that scripture is telling me, telling us how to love. It's telling us what love looks like. It looks like Jesus. So when I was thinking about this scripture and I've been meditating on it and thinking about it, I noticed that that little word as, it's a tiny little word, but it's doing a lot of heavy lifting in that uh, scripture. We're to love as Jesus has loved us. So how did Jesus love us? And how does he love us? Well, if we think about how he lived, I love all those instances, and there's so many of them where it says Jesus was moved with compassion. You know, Heidi Baker coined the phrase, didn't she, stopping for the one. And the way she, she coined that phrase, the way she got the idea of that phrase is just looking at Jesus. He just constantly stopped. He was constantly interrupted. He'd be constantly trying to get somewhere to go and do something, and he would stop when he saw the need. And I think about, you know, him grieving over John the Baptist's death, trying to find somewhere quiet to be by himself, and yet he's surrounded by all these needy people, and he puts his own uh, needs to one side and ministers to over 5,000 people. Uh, that's how Jesus, that's how he lived. I can think um, how he taught, what he taught. You know, and just off the top of my head, the story of the Good Samaritan, you know, where uh, the Pharisees kind of saying, well, you know, who is my neighbor? Can we sort of narrow this down? Can we kind of limit who I have to kind of put myself out for? And we learn through that story that actually is anybody you meet who is in need. That's your neighbor. And so that's the kind of thing that Jesus taught. But obviously... How did Jesus love us? The most important, significant way is he gave his life for us. He died on that cross for you and me. He carried the weight of my sin, my guilt, my shame, my wickedness, my wrongdoing, yours too, all the consequences of it, uh, the horrors of it. Um, he took all the pain. Uh, you know, he was humiliated, mocked, spat on, despised, you know, in crucial, in, in excruciating pain, physically, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And he did it for you, and he did it for me. And uh, I've been reading Romans um, recently, and the thing Paul can't get over is that he did that while we were enemies of God, while we were still sinners, you know, Jesus died for us. And he can't, it blows his mind. While we were powerless, there's nothing in us. And he does all this, you know, we might, you know, give our lives for somebody who's good, but Jesus did this for you and me when we were filthy in sin. And he's that holy God. So, that is who Jesus is, and that is how he loves. And I guess if I was going to sum it up in, you know, one word, I might say sacrificially. He gave his life for you and for me so that we could have what we need the most, forgiveness and a father. Pure 
unconditional, passionate, sacrificial love. So by looking at Jesus, I get to know what love is. You know, and I look at the cross and I know that love doesn't stop. It doesn't turn away when things get tough. I know it's a love that doesn't give me the whole cold shoulder when I get things wrong. It's a love that doesn't stop no matter how much I blow it. It's a love that puts my needs before his own. It's a love that actually doesn't even depend on me. It's all coming from him and nothing I can do can stop it. It's a love that is strong. It's a love that doesn't give up when faced with hatred or any kind of opposition. That's how Jesus loves you and me. So my simple definition of love, of how I'm to love others, is doing what is best for another no matter what the cost is to myself. That's what love looks like. Doing what is best for another person, no matter the cost to myself. That's how Jesus loved and that is how I am to love others. How on earth do we do that if that's the standard? That word as is telling me, Debs, you have to love as Jesus loved and then I feel daunted so how do I love as Jesus loved practically looking at me and what I'm like but then again I look at that word as and it gives me another clue and um, gives me some encouragement which I want to share with you so Jesus says it's a new command I'm telling you, love others as I have loved you. And I think to myself, you know, well, how is that new? You know, what's new about that? So I want you to track with me a little moment. So back in uh, Matthew 22, that Pharisee comes to Jesus and he asks this specific question. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Okay, I want you to think about that phrase, in the law, which is the greatest commandment. And that's when Jesus tells us, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So in the old covenant, in the law, we're to love God with everything we've got and to love our neighbor as ourself. Now, that gives me some problems because... Uh, I have good and bad days about loving myself. I have good and bad days about loving God. Don't tell anyone. So that, those two, two verses kind of make me fix on my efforts, my efforts to try and love God with everything I've got and to love my neighbor. And um, they leave me open to concern because you know, if anybody was to say to me, Debs, do you love Jesus enough? You know, the answer's always going to kind of be no. So I'm always left with that worry. It's down to me. So I think the reason Jesus calls it a new commandment is because in the new covenant, he comes and lives inside me. And everything I do, he can be my source, the one in whom I live. So, you know, in the old covenant, the Holy Spirit, you know, rested on priests, prophets, and kings. But the amazing thing is, is when Jesus died on that cross and when I put my faith in him, in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus comes to live in me. I become a temple in which he dwells. And I think Jesus wants me and wants you to continually be drinking from him and drinking in his love. And 
as he loves me, I can love others. And I say uh, drink because there's so many scriptures that kind of give us that analogy. It's like drinking. So Jesus says, come to me, all you who are thirsty and drink from me. And out of your innermost being will come rivers of living water, not trickling, not even a stream, but rivers of living water. And there's that amazing um, scripture, one of my favorites in Ephesians 3, where Paul says that we're to be rooted in God's love and it reminds me of Psalm 1 with the tree planted by the river that we're meant to be drinking up continually, continually being filled with the love of God. And in fact, in John 15, Jesus tells us, I want you to remain in me, just like a branch has to remain in the vine. If it, if it doesn't, it's just going to become a dry twig. And so you have that impression of the sap, as it were, of Jesus' life flowing through us, just like the sap flows through the tree to the leaves. Um, so we're to be remaining in Jesus, abiding in him, staying in him, making our home in him. And you know, Jesus is God. God is love. So we're to make our home in God's love. And in fact, Jesus spells it out. He says in John 15, remain in my love. I think that's where God wants us to live. He wants us to live from that place of continually soaking up, living in the good of, being fed by drinking in his love. And that's where the power comes for us to love the way Jesus loved. It's always God first, then us. You know, it's not we loved God first and then he loved us. In 1 John 4, it's we love because he first loved loved us. So be good to do another talk sometime on how do we stay in that love. And I remember listening to this talk, I think the guy's name was something like Chip Judd, um, American name Chip, and he said it took him three years to learn how to remain in God's love. And what he would do is every time he noticed he was in fear, he would step back and think, what am I believing? repent of it and step back into the truth that God loved him. And now he lives continually aware of how loved he is by God. That's got to be something that we all want to aim for. So I want to tell you a little bit about how the Holy Spirit can help us to love God and to love others and just give a little testimony. Um, so I... This is a while ago now, but I was praying and praying because I knew that uh, my heart wasn't a loving heart. It was a dutiful heart. So, I mean, that's good, isn't it? It's good to be somebody who's reliable and, you know, if you're committed and if you say you're going to do something that you do it. But, you know, we don't go around saying, you know, where is it like this? Idea, idea, our duty, yeah. No. It's not going to catch on, Debs. It's I love you. It's not I duty you. I keep thinking instead of doing this, I could be doing a D. A D. No, it's not going to work, is it? It's not going to take off. Um, so I was just saying, break my heart, God. Batter my heart, God. Get away this heart of stone. This, this heart that doesn't seem to have much capacity to really be passionate. And I'm fire for you and I'm passionate about others. You know, can you do something about my heart? And had the opportunity to go to Toronto. This is way back, 1994, when I was about two. Um, and uh, I went there and on the last night, uh, the man there gave a sermon. And the sermon really spoke to me because he talked about romance films and about how the lover has to kind of fight these incredible battles and climb these mountains and ford these, you know, rivers and get through every opposition to get to the one he, he loves. And I realized, oh, you're speaking my language. I love romantic films. And it made me realize that, oh, when I'm looking at them, I'm getting a glimpse of who Jesus is and what Jesus is like. And suddenly I got connected with the fact that Jesus didn't 
well, it's my duty, it's the thing I've got to do, I'm going to go to the cross. It was, he was passionate about me and he fought for me. And, um, you know, I was the, the one, you and I are the ones that he, he fought every battle, climbed over every opposition, did whatever needed to be done because he couldn't stand to be separated. And it, so it, it, it lit something up in me. And then I went up for prayer and there's this guy, you know, chewing gum. And he just looked at me and he went, break that heart of stone. And I felt, you know, the Holy Spirit's presence really on me, uh, really doing something inside. I wasn't quite sure what it was, it, um, but it was something really powerful. And then the next day I was on the plane going home. And I had this picture reminder of my wedding. Um, I was 40 minutes sort of late to my wedding. Um, didn't have a watch on. That's the only reason. And um, I could see Jesus and he was at the end of the aisle. It wasn't Jamie waiting for me. It was Jesus waiting for me. And I realized he'd done something in my heart and he had, he had brought it alive. He'd given me a passion for him. He'd made it the, the words that were cold and seemed, you know, dutiful, um, alive and on fire that he loved me and he'd made my heart come alive. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do with you and with me. I want to remind you of that prophecy of that we've had just, you know, two or three months ago about life spring being like a fountain that isn't connected to the source. And praise God, Jesus has got his overalls on and he's coming and he wants us to give him time so that he can fix us. Because I think he wants us to live continually connected to him with his love and life flowing through us. I think God's heart is that we always live in his love. We have that phrase, don't we? God is good all the time. I can't hear you. All the time, God is good. And I want to say, God loves me all the time. All the time, God loves me. God loves you all the time. All the time, God loves you. And I want us to live as a church from that place. So that way you and I can live as Jesus loved us. Thanks for watching this message. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. To find out more about our church, head to linktr.ee forward slash LifespringUK.